Here I was at Galerias Preciados, a big department store in Madrid, Spain, trying to buy a blouse. But it seemed to me that there were more than a thousand blouses there, and I didn't have a clue how to choose. And I was so confused and overwhelmed that I ran out of the store crying. Now, you might say, what's so big? What is a big deal about buying a blouse? Well, the problem was I had just come out two weeks before from Cuba, my country of origin, where I had been under communism rule for 12 years. So I didn't learn to make choices because there were no choices to be had. See, the government will let me buy one blouse, one skirt, one dress, one pair of shoes a year. But that was if they were available on the stores. And half of the time there was nothing on the stores. So if, they, if something came, you had to go, get in line, and then by the time you got in, you were lucky if they still had your size, and they usually had only one color. So I didn't have to choose anything. But now I was in Madrid. I had left Cuba alone. My parents could not come with me, I was 18 years old, and I was a mess. I didn't know how to make choices. I had to learn in a hurry. See, I had only a blouse, a skirt, and a dress when I came out, and the shoes on my feet, that was it. So, uh, an, an aunt of mine had sent me $25 that to me at that time, we we're talking 1970, was a good amount of money, but I needed to buy with that, that blouse that I was having so much of a hard time with, a skirt, and I needed also shoes, and I needed underwear. Well, it took me three times to go back to the store before I could make my choices and buy what I had to buy. You know, it, it was a time of learning a lot of things, but by the time my parents came out, six months after, I had a job, I knew how to navigate Madrid and its subway system, I had my friends at church, and I had grown a lot in my own confidence and in the things that I could do. My parents were kind of amazed because I had never before left home, and now here I was teaching them what I had learned. And um, so that was my first encounter with a challenging, really challenging moment. And from there, anything else was not such a big problem because it paled in comparison with that first moment when I just left Cuba and had to learn everything from scratch. <laughs> One of the main reasons I left Cuba at 18 years old is because I have always been thirsty for knowledge and I wanted to be able to further my education. Well, you might think, wait a second, is an education free in Cuba? Well, yes and no. After the sixth grade, if I wanted to be able to go on, I would have had to become part of the communist Jews, which meant I would have had to be willing to spy on people and tell on them. Well, because I was not willing to do that, I could not keep studying. So here I was, 18 years of age, and I had only sixth grade. So after a few months in Spain, when we moved to Costa Rica with my parents, I had to start on the seventh grade. I was almost 20 years old by then. I didn't want to go year by year by year, you know, it was too complicated. So I, I studied on my own and I took exams for every subject and of every year from seventh grade until the junior year of high school. And then during the school year, I took the junior and the senior years together. I was going to classes for the junior, junior classes in the morning and for the senior classes in the afternoon. So in a year and a half, I did finish high school. 
But now I wanted to come to the United States to start a college program in music education. There was only a slight problem. I didn't know any English, nothing, zero. Well, I was ready for a challenge because I wanted to come and start my program. And come I did. Luckily for me, and that's what saved me, I came for the second semester because in Costa Rica classes ended in November. So I came for January. And therefore the college was not set up to give the English proficiency test that they usually gave to foreign students that were coming on a student visa like me. So they decided to let me register on a uh, let's see how she does. Now we are talking 1972, no internet, no Google Translate, nothing of the sort. And I was not the type that learns easily by just going through grammar and vocabulary and things like that. So what I did was I went to the library, I took out children's books, starting with fifth, first grade books, and I went grade by grade going up as I understood and could read whatever the kids in first or second grade will read, I will graduate myself to the next level. And meanwhile, the fellow students in the music program will try to really listen and figure out what I was trying to say. And they will say it back to me in the right way, you know, with the right grammar and the right pronunciation. And my roommate, bless her heart, she would make me read every evening from a book and she will have to correct every other word at least to tell me how to say it right. Well, I needed to pass all my classes because I was on a foreign student visa and I had to take full 12 credits and I did. By the end of the school year, I passed all my classes and I could understand about half of what was going on now, I didn't take classes that were too complicated. I took math because the math in Latin America is higher level than in the States, so I knew I would understand it. I took Bible, I took choir, I took piano, and I took reading. Now, that one was a bit of a problem because I, <laughs> I found out that it was developmental reading, which meant speed reading. Well, it was me who didn't know how to read in English, and I was taking speed reading. But actually it was not too bad because they were doing big words in the reading, which most of them had Latin roots. So the other kids were struggling more than me because I could say those and understand them better. Go figure. But anyways, I did learn my English. Yeah, you will say she still has an accent. Of course, you can blame it on the Texans I, because that's what I went to college for. No, seriously, it's, it's just to keep me humble and keep me remembering that I do have to keep learning all my life. <laughs>
And she said, oh, no, you are not doing anything of the kind. You are going to go because I want to have peace of mind that you have started your program because I know you. And if you start the program, I know you will finish it. And I want to know that you are going to do that. So I said, okay, mom. Well, you can't imagine my mixed feeling. On the one hand, I was happy that I was starting my PhD. But on the other hand, I was really worried about my mom's health. And every day I was expecting a call telling me that she had died. Really, it was that bad. But I would call her every evening and she would ask, always ask me how, was, how my day had gone, if I was enjoying my classes, how were the other people, so on and so forth. And she did wait for me as she promised me she would do. So after my 10 days were over and I, I went back home, she was still alive, barely. Two weeks later, she had died. But I did fulfill my promise to her. Not only did I start in my program, but three and a half, three and a half years later, even though I was mourning her still, and I had gone through a divorce and I had moved across the country, I did finish my doctorate, defended my thesis, and got my degree. Thank you so much for watching the making of an entrepreneur docuseries. I just want to take a moment to talk to you. That, that's right, you that's watching right now, um, you the mom, or maybe you're the dad, or, or maybe you're, you're an entrepreneur, or perhaps you're an auntie or an uncle, but you're someone out there that, that has a heart to give, uh, you have a heart to serve, and as you're watching this making of an entrepreneur docuseries, you may be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, wait a minute, I've had some, some life lessons, I've, I've had some setbacks, I've had some experiences, I've gone through some things that have helped me become a better person, and, and I want to take that and I want to release that to other folks. Okay. Maybe you're a speaker and you're already doing it. Maybe you've written books and you've already done that. Or maybe the story that's inside of you, the expertise that's inside of you, the message inside of you, this is the right platform for you to make a bigger difference and a bigger impact in the world. Now, this whole making of an entrepreneur docuseries, um, if you had to sum it up in, in just one word, and it's kind of hard to do that, but as I'm talking to you and you're listening right now, you might be saying, Shay, what's the one word? And the one word I would say is just legacy legacy. Um, there's a legacy I understand that you want to leave for your family, and I get that, but there's also a legacy of your knowledge. There's a legacy of your expertise, and think about this. You're able to share your message or share your story or share your expertise, and, and long after you're gone, they still have a window into the soul of who you are and the impact that that leaves behind. Now, if that's you and you someone that's want to get the information, you're, you're someone that's ready to do something bigger than just your business and bigger than just making more money, but you want to have more meaning in the world, uh, do me a favor. Go over to www.themakingofanentrepreneurdocuseries.com. I know that's a long email, a long address, but I want you to hear it again one more time. Themakingofanentrepreneur.com. Now, when you get there, just put your first name and your last name and your phone number and information in there. Worst case scenario, you have a meeting with the team and decide, hey, me being a cast member, this isn't a good fit, but I had a lot of fun. Best case scenario, you decide to take a step. Folks understand your backstory, uh, understand what you've been through, and uh, the world is much better off um, while you're here. And when the day comes and you decide to transition and, and move on, it's still doing very, very well. So with that being said, I just want to pop in. Thanks a lot for watching the Making of an Entrepreneur series. Uh, my name is Shay Brown. I want to encourage you to continue to watch and um, I'll see you at the next episode. God bless. I remember it as if it were yesterday, the moment when I was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, at one of the intensive classes for my doctoral program, where I knew that I had to divorce my husband. Uh, we had been married for a long time, but it was not a good relationship. So I was with my classmates at this beautiful gallery where they had an exposition by Lena Bar Bartula. And the name of, the, of her exposition was Journeys, which resonated with me since I have had many journeys in my life. But there was one picture 
that really was as if it has punched me on the stomach. And it was called the tethered uh, journey. So it was, the picture was about a person that was trying to take off in a journey, but they were tethered, their hands and their feet, and they couldn't move. And I said, oh my God, that's exactly how I feel in my marriage. I cannot do this anymore. I have to find my freedom again, this time not from communism, but for a bad relationship. So I said, in a year, when my younger kid is going to be graduating from high school and my oldest from college, and I will be done with my classes, will have only my dissertation to do, I'm going to divorce. And I know that then I cannot stay in Michigan where we were living for many reasons, including, you know, here I am, someone that works with couples, divorcing my husband. And then the church I was a part of, they, they were not going to be supportive of me divorcing my husband. So I made my plans, I made contacts, I said, I'm going to move all the way down to Texas. Because see, Texas is the state of my heart. So my children came to my rescue because they had been asking me for years why I didn't divorce his father, their father. So when they knew I was going to do this, we put my stuff between my car and a U-Haul that we rented, and they went with me to help me move to the new apartment that I had rented for myself. And we had a ball as we did that. And I cannot tell you that it was easy because it was not, but during my time there in Texas, uh, I had many new beginnings again. I, I took my national exam for my license as a marriage and family therapist. I became a US citizen there in Texas, my preferred place. And um, I did many things. I bought a house, I made new friends. I, I just felt that I was free again. <laughs> So my time in Texas, and then later on two years that I spent in Germany doing marriage and family therapy for the military at the Wiesbaden Air Force Base in the midst of the whole Iraq debacle, um, it was a time for me for healing, for trying my new wings, for, for traveling all, all over Europe, for making friends again, you know, you, you are, I have a theme in my life, which is new beginnings, you know, every once in a while. Anyways, I had tried some dating during that time, not too much, but you know, I was no spring chicken, I was over 50. And here I was in a new world in which dating was done mostly online. And so I had tried different dating sites, but when I came back to Delaware, I said, well, if I want to find love again, I, I have to get serious about this online dating thing. So I became part of Match.com. And this is not a commercial. They don't know I'm saying this, but it's true. That's, that's where I went. And I wrote my profile and I started looking for men that were five years older, five years younger than me, you know, that range. But I... I I went on a few dates, it didn't work out, I, I didn't feel comfortable, they didn't seem to be the right fit. So one day I, I expanded my search to men between my age and 10 years older, and there I found him, Roger. And there were two things that caught my eye. Number one, his smile reached his eyes. So I said, this is a person that is a happy person. And number two, his honesty. You know how in those profiles on dating sites, if you have ever looked at them, men try to say what they think a woman would like to hear. You know, I would love to walk by the sea on the moonshine. Never mind that they probably never will want to find themselves dead in there. But they say that because they think women want to hear it. Or they say, oh, I love my puppy so much and I, I wouldn't mind getting two other puppies in my pack. 
even though they probably they don't want to. But the, the opening lines on my soon-to-be husband profile was, it's not that I hate cats and dogs, but I don't want to live with them. And I said, bingo, that's me right now. I don't want to live with pets either. I have done that already, children, pets, all of that stuff. Now I want to be able to be free to do, to travel, all of that. So I said, eh, I'm going to send a note to this guy. Well, evidently he liked what he saw too because he answered my note. And after several telephone calls, we decided to meet together for dinner. No, for lunch. And that lunch date, our first date, lasted six hours. Well, the weather cooperated because there was a big storm outside. It was raining a lot and thundering and lightning and everything. And the people at the restaurant said, oh, don't worry, nobody's coming or going, so just take your time. Well, we, we certainly did take our time. And we had a ball just talking and laughing and we, we hit it off. And we dated for Two years after that, one of the things we did was we read the Purpose Field Life. We read one chapter every evening. He came every day to my home and we read it. And that really helped us to know about our values, about who we really were, and to connect and to know what our beliefs were. And then on March 28 of 2010, we got married and we have been married for 12 years now very happily. Because I like freedom to be my own boss, most of my life, of my life I have been kind of like an entrepreneur, even when I was the director of a counseling center at a university in Mexico, I was not working full time. I needed that freedom to feel that I was not a full time worker. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, in a way, I have been that way all my life. But after I came back from Germany to Delaware, I said, this is it. I probably will not move from here anymore because I'm, I'm getting up there. So, I need to be serious about starting my own business. Well, at the time, I didn't know much about marketing. I knew a lot about my subject matters, but I didn't know about marketing and how I connect with people and all of that. So I, I had kind of give myself a training in all of that entrepreneurship stuff that I really didn't know much about. So I started and I started growing first my, my business with couples because that's probably my first love. I love working with busy, high achieving couples that maybe have left behind their relationship a bit because they are so busy. So they have not been doing the things they need to do and they feel kind of distant. I love to help them to reconnect and find again their passion. So I started with that and started growing that. But because my PhD was in organizational behavior, I also had a passion to work with leaders in organizations. Because, you know, nowadays we hear a lot about diversity and many organizations are doing a better job of having more diversity, but a lot of them don't do as good with using that diversity in a way that is good because people don't know how to have those conversations. They don't know how to let the voices of all the diverse people in the organization be heard and be used in their organization. And, and I love doing that. I love helping them how to learn to, to be better at communicating. And then I also love working with women so that they can, if they are in transition, like I have transitioned so many other times in my life, so that they can not only survive the transitions, but thrive through their transitions. So I just love what I do. And as the years have gone by, I have reached more clients, not only in Delaware, but all around, because again, we have the internet now. And even though I'm 70 years old, my children have been pretty good at taking me by the hair and bringing me into this new 
century with all that technology. So I, I keep my own website, I do my own stuff, and I enjoy it. So I think that is a great thing to be an entrepreneur, and I'm glad that I went that way. <laughs>
you start thinking more in terms of, so what am I going to leave behind? And what you really leave behind is love, not things. People will remember you. I hope they will remember me because I love them. Just like I love God because he first loved me. <laughs>
when I work with couples, I find partners that don't dare to say what they think because the other one wants to control them so much that it's going to spark a conflict. Even in universities where that are supposed to encourage free thinking, I find students that f don't feel they can speak up in class, that they cannot ask certain questions. You know, this country was found on freedom. People wanted to be free, and yet, even though it was founded on freedom, they were having slaves. They were having people that were not free. And it has taken many years to get off that mindset that freedom is for everyone. And sometimes we ourselves are our worst enemy on that. We talk to ourselves in ways that chain us. We talk to ourselves sometimes in worse ways than other people talk to us about. And I think that the creator gave us free will because he wanted us to cherish freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of thinking, freedom of talking, freedom of being, freedom of becoming. And so to me, that's probably the most important thing in life to cherish that freedom and to not abuse it, but to use it in the right way. One reason organizations hire me is because almost everybody nowadays have issues with communication. They think that they know how to talk to each other, but many times they don't talk to each other, at least not in the right ways. You know, I have worked with, with teams that they, instead of talking to each other, they are, they are just bickering or they are just sending texts in a way that they misinterpret each other. Uh, and for me, being able to have conversations face to face, eye to eye, is what makes for connections. And when you can communicate in a way that connects, that's when you truly can have, can be successful in any kind of organization, being it big or small. Um, so one of the things I do when I go inside of organizations is number one, to make people feel safe so that they can have conversations. Because one of the reasons people don't have conversations is they don't feel safe. They say, well, if I say what I think, um, I'm going to lose my job, or they are not going to like me, or the boss is going to be against me. So you have to create an atmosphere where everybody feels safe. And you have to do that together as a group. And then once there is that safety, then I give them pointers on how to be able to talk to each other, or I facilitate a meeting. I remember one meeting I facilitated in Iceland in which we had about 60 people from the same organization, but it was an international organization with several uh, places around the world. And when we were organizing the meeting, one of the persons that didn't know me too well kept asking me, kept saying to me, but you know that these are engineers, right? Engineers don't talk. And I will say, don't worry, these engineers will talk. And they will keep saying, but, but they don't talk. And I kept saying, but they will talk. And sure enough, we had two and a half days together and they did talk and we did make lots of progress. And they said at the end, you know, we have, we have made more progress in these two and a half days than in the last two years in which we were not really talking to each other. I mean, they were even reinventing the wheel, trying to solve problems that one area had already solved, but had not communicated to this other area. So that's what I do. That's why I think that organizations like to hire me because I can, I can sense in a way, because I was in a totalitarian place before, when there is fear, and that's why people not talk. And I can also give them the right tools so that they can have the conversations that matter, the conversations that connect and that can make them be really good at what they do. Well, this has been a great experience today with Che and his team. Boy, I have enjoyed just being relaxed, doing this filming, 
having the pictures taken and having conversations too, because that's my thing, having conversations. So when I am able to have conversations with the people that are around me, I feel connected. And I really thank Che and his team for making this possible so that I can utilize it in many different ways. <laughs>